Good morning. Today I want to wrap up the Hunger Games by talking about language. I've talked in previous presentations about how this book in a lot of ways can be a book about story, both individual and communal. We've talked about it being a book about dreams. Certainly it's a book that merges history and fiction and fantasy and dystopia and looks at an old dystopia, the residential schools, and you know links them to the dystopia of the novel, the fact that the indigenous people were hunted and viewed as a crop for their dreams. It is also a book about language, and it's a book about the native language, the need to preserve the native language, and the fact that the native language was the key to dreams and the key to stopping the recruiters. I think Demoline also does something with the English language. If you take a look at the slide, there are th quotations from three or four reviews here. Graceful, almost fragile prose. And again, I think the people in the novel are both graceful and fragile. The prose reflects that. Uh, the style of writing was mystical and certainly the ability to be in touch with the past, to be in touch with the dreams, to use the dreams as a way to uh, forestall the dystopia, I think was a mystical element of it as well. And certainly Minerva provided that mystical element, the element of magical realism that I'm not gonna talk about very much here, but is certainly a part of this novel. And painfully or with exquisite beauty. And I think, again, the language is exquisitely beautiful. And I think it sometimes takes the mundane and moves us into the sense of awe. So we're just going to take a look at some of the language that Demoline uses and take a look at how the language helps create the effect. Finally, I think, it, even though I don't consider myself a formalist, uh, I prefer looking at things with the big patterns of archetypes. I prefer looking at themes. I spend a lot of time talking about character connection, uh, conflict, and theme. I think ever so often we have to step back and admire the beauty and admire the, the ability to use language well. First of all, I think the language gets us to the senses and gets us to the emotions. If you look at this quotation from page one, my brother popped the bag to cover our hurt. That sound of the bag popping, covering the hurt, the emotional pain, and like cheese scented fireworks. So now we're affecting the sight, not only the sound, but we're affecting sight with fireworks. We're affecting the sense of smell with the nacho cheese Doritos. At least I hope, it, well, it must've been nacho cheese, uh, which smell far better than Cool Ranch. And then I got the word loud to, again, get to the ear. Uh, release of air can be both sound and, again, tied to the smell, okay? Processed cheese dust, uh, you know, again, sight, smell, taste, all of that can be part of that. And we go from the senses being depressed to the sound and all of the senses being affected emotionally linked. So... She's pulling out all the stops on page one with just simple language, but getting us to hear and see and smell just as much as we're reading, okay? The metaphor. I think that there are a lot of metaphors in this, this novel. Uh, Demoline sprinkles them throughout the novel, but I thought this one was particularly beautiful. The stars being perforations, revealing the bleached skeleton of the universe through a collection of tiny holes. Obviously, the idea that stars being perforations gives us the metaphor. The idea that the universe has a bleached skeleton gives us his metaphor. And this, the idea that the night sky is just this collection of tiny holes. I think it gives us a sense of awe. It gives us a sense of wonder. And I think one of the things that allowed Frenchie, allowed Midge to get through 
all of the dystopian elements of of their lives was the idea of the sense of wonder was the idea that they contained these dreams or that within them was the dreams that their marrow contained in the dreams and that that allowed them to have this sense of wonder to have this sense of uh, looking at the universe figuratively and not just looking at the rain and the wet and the cold um, they could look at something at a far more metaphysical level I think also that her language gets us to dreams in another way. Frenchie's braiding his hair each morning. He's very, very proud of the braid. Uh, he's proud of the fact that it has the longest braid. Um, he, it's slightly longer than Derek's, which he believes gives him an advantage in the romance department. But this physical act, this mundane act of braiding the hair reminds us once again of the idea of dreams. I braided my hair each morning to keep it out of the way and to remind myself of things I couldn't quite remember, but that I nevertheless, but that nevertheless, I knew to be true. I think this is the act of every morning we wake up. Sometimes we kind of remember the dream. Sometimes we remember having the dream, but we can't really remember what it was. Whether we believe our dreams are true or not, a lot of times we're reminded of the dream when we first wake up as we're just lying in bed as we're trying to get out of bed and we're reminded of this dream and we're reminded that we can't quite remember it fully but we know we had it we know it's true that that dream existed in us and i think this is one of the ways that demoline is subtly linking dreams through the rest of to everything that happens that the dream isn't just in their marrow that the dreams aren't just, you know, the dreams for the future or the dreams they have while they're sleeping, that the dreams are something that are woven throughout the entire life of the characters in this novel. Even if they can't remember them, they can still know that they're true. The simile, again, we're going to look at the senses. The world out here was quiet, so we're getting the sound like the land was holding its breath. And once again, we can probably even get to sight thinking about the idea of everything just kind of being sucked in for a second and seeing everything bend as it sucks in or everything bulge as it sucks in the air. And then if you really listened, once again, sound, put conscious action into listening, things began to sing. And again, the simile quiet, like the land is holding its breath, allows us to think about beauty. And so when we talk about things beginning to sing, and the next word is insects, we don't think about annoying buzzing. We don't think about things getting in our ears. We don't think about uh, how annoying insects usually are. We think about this idea of song. And now we have the contrast of quiet, the contrast of song, Perhaps we can even put it into a spiritual sense of having church and you've got the moment of prayer, the moment of silence, and then you've got the people singing a hymn, something like that. Also, we get the idea of sight and we get the idea of beauty with something pirouetting. I mean, the only time I see the term pirouette is in dancing. Perhaps it's a running back, running away from somebody, but the pirouette is the sign of something graceful, something elegant, something beautiful. And so we link the quiet with the beauty. We link the quiet with, you know, sucking in, holding one's breath. And again, the idea of what happens when something beautiful occurs and we're holding our breath uh, just in the sense of awe looking at that. I mean, I pretty sure that that's what happened to me the first time I saw the Pacific Ocean and the vastness of it all. It was just, you kind of pull back in and maybe you're not holding your breath like you're underwater, but it's, it is something where you just breathe in a little bit. And I think we're getting with quiet, we're getting with beauty. And again, the simile gets us that, 
and it gets us to think about not just one sense, but several. Alliteration. Uh, when I did the dreams thing, I had the uh, poem, uh, What Happens to a Dream Deferred? And Langston Hughes repeats that D sound uh, throughout and gets us this idea of deferred and dreams and um, does all of those words came became part of the the sound of the poem. If you look at this passage where they're in the the uh, uh, lodge for the first time, okay, I've got lit, and then I've got hall and pale. It's not necessarily alliteration, but that repetition of the L sound in the middle and beginning of words keeps going, and then. Later on, a couple lines down, I got feral, fairy. I've got that repetition of the F sound. And as I'm reading this whole quotation, there is the, the little bits of repetition. We walked, once again. Um, repetition of the sounds give us a sense of awe and wonder. The moon lit the wide front hall in pale ribbons turning the dust and broken bits of chair and wainscoting and climbing vines from the feral houseplants into fairy tale turrets. We walked slowly out of habit, out of fear, but also out of reverence. This space felt untouched. We could feel the thrum of old activity sliding along the floorboards. And so when you take a look at this, the idea of the repetition of the sounds, whether it's the feral to the fairy tale, whether it's the we, and the walk, the repetition of those sounds, I think gets us to the idea of reverence. And you've got pale ribbons and you've got all sorts of things that could be dusty and terrible and ugly and spooky and scary. And even a term like feral, you know, wild, bestial. But it's a fairy tale. And it goes a step beyond a fairy tale because I don't think very many people feel reverence with a fairy tale, but here they feel the sense of reverence. And again, I think the alliteration and the descriptive language uh, and the sound of all of the other things help get me there. I think it's important for all of us to remember that sound and using sound and poetic devices happens in prose just as much as it happens in poetry. I think sometimes we forget that. Words used in new ways. Snow fell in light dusting. That's not too new. It looked like glitter. That's not too new. Scrape from the underside of clouds is kind of nice, but it's not really new or original. So, snow felt, fell in a light dusting now. It looked like glitter scraped from the underside of clouds by the scrubby top of branches of pines. The skeletons of the green trees curved under the elegant weight of the snow. And here, all of a sudden, I'm taking a look at elegant. And I have rarely see the idea of elegant and weight mixed together. When weight is being talked about, it is ponderous and it is clumsy and it is heavy and, and it's debilitating. But here, just switching it to elegant now makes me think of the skeletons having more of motion, perhaps even thinking about the skeletons reanimating. Uh, again, there's green trees, so we're probably talking about pines and, and the idea of evergreens. But it's the use of elegant, not some of the regular uses like dusting of snow, but the use of elegant and weight that all of a sudden brings once again the sense of beauty. And now I've got bowing and twisting and like ribbons in the wind, kind of I think that that last part would be out of place if I didn't have elegant and weight going together. And Demoline, I think just with that one word, adds a sense of beauty to the whole, you know, to this passage. Finally, I have to talk, well, not finally, I think there's a couple more slides, but I have to talk about Pearl Jam. Uh, Frenchie's uncle is playing it. Uh, he calls Pearl Jam real tradish. Frenchie, I don't think, understands Pearl Jam, but this metaphor of it sounds like if gray could make noise i think pearl jam should put that on any album they release any 
you know, in the future, or should go back to any of the albums they have released and stamp this slot on the bottom. Sounds like if Gray could make noise. It's, I think, a beautiful way to think about uh, music and think about actually the life that they're living. The idea that the Gray, which can be debilitating, or, you know, not debilitating, but can be something that causes sadness, can make some noise and bring a little bit of joy. Finally, and I probably should have moved this to yesterday's uh, slide, um, or Wednesday's presentation, excuse me. One of the things that I think Demoline does too much is gives us this foreshadowing. And it's as if she beats us over the head with the foreshadowing time after time after time. Um, and part of that is, this is one of just one of the examples. Neither of us could imagine that everything would change in just a few hours, including the idea of keys. Oh, good. We're going to have something happen. We're going to get the idea of keys changing, and it's going to happen in a few hours. Apparently, this is a big deal. Something's going to happen. And Demoline, I think, does this too much. I don't know if it, you know, fits in this language section, but it's one of the things I wanted to point out. Uh, as one of the flaws I have with the novel. I think it's a great novel. I think it's a beautiful novel. I think it tells an important story and should serve as an important reminder to how both American and Canadian governments have treated uh, the Native American indigenous people. But ever so often, there are some little flaws, and this is one of them. Okay, today we've got a quiz and uh, daily writing, so this one's gonna, it's gonna be a little bit short. Uh, I hope all of you have a good weekend. And we're going to start with uh, a far different book on uh, Monday.